Hey everybody, uh, welcome to Open Space, your uh, weekly conversation with me about all things space and astronomy. So this is just to catch every single thing that slips through the cracks um, uh, that I haven't talked about in my videos, in my QAs, everything. So uh, of course, this is one of the episodes where I have no idea what it is that we're going to talk about. That's your problem, not mine. So for all the people who are watching, uh, go ahead and uh, just let me know uh, what questions you might have about space and astronomy. Anything you want me to uh, wax uh, eloquently on for, uh, for a while, any topics that you want me to go into, uh, please let me know. Um, again, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we will be going on hiatus. This is the second to last. So I love the word penultimate. And so I can't wait to use it. This is the penultimate episode of open space. I'll do one more episode, um, next week, next Monday, and then we're going to go on hiatus for July and August. So astronomy cast weekly space, hangout, open space, uh, the virtual star party, they will all go on hiatus. Now that said, uh, you're not going to be without content. Of course, I'm still working on my newsletter every week. I am still going to be releasing episodes of the guide to space and the question shows. They just won't be require a live high speed internet connection that I have to sit in front of. And so it'll allow me to do things like go visit people or leave my house. Um, <clears throat> it's very important, very refreshing. Um, I will also be doing a bunch more of Essentially, that's when I get a chance to do all of my experimenting. So we're going to, uh, we're getting some new telescopes set up through Oceanside Photo and Telescope, uh, better cameras, better telescopes uh, in different locations. And so I'm going to be practicing using these new telescopes and figuring out ways to present what's going to happen in the star party in a better way. So wouldn't be surprised if you see me showing up um, randomly, both on YouTube and especially on Twitch, because I, I don't know, I feel like Twitch is like this low impact place where I can do experiments and, uh, and then they can be forgotten. So uh, if you want, if you haven't already, go to uh, twitch.tv slash FK if you want to see where I'm going to be doing stuff on Twitch. But apart from that, uh, let's get into uh, this week's uh, open space. So if you have any questions for me about space and or astronomy, let me know. Well, Mixer is dead now. Is Mixer dead? Oh, uh, somebody who exists. Do you think the newly discovered Proxima C is a gas giant or a terrestrial planet? Uh, great question. We just, that's going to be tomorrow's episode. It's already set up and ready to do the premiere tomorrow at um, uh, 11 o'clock. I have to do it a little bit early because I have to go to the dentist. My dentist has finally opened up. And so I'm, it's been like three months late for me to go to the dentist. And so I'm going to, oh, it's going to be awful just going to be misery. So I'm going to do the premiere at 11 and then I'm going to do the, uh, the visit with the dentist. Um, but yeah, the, the, it's most likely that it is a, uh, gas giant. It's much more massive. It has a very long, slow orbit. Um, but we don't know much. I mean, we know the orbit, but I don't know if we know much more than that. So, um, uh, more information, more research is necessary. I mean, what's crazy is that they were able to actually see it. So uh, we talk about this in the video, and I'll show you some actual pictures tomorrow of Proxima Centauri C, that uh, the story of how they found this planet is absolutely incredible, where a researcher had been studying Proxima Centauri using the Hubble Space Telescope for quite a while, trying to find any evidence of planets. And he was looking for any essential motions in the star moving around in a little tiny circle caused by the orbit of a planet. He missed the one that's really close inside the habitable zone, and he missed the one that takes almost 2,000 days to go around. He was looking for anything that was between one and 1,000 days. And so it turns out that it takes 2,000 days. And so some researchers earlier this year found a hint of um, that it takes uh, that there's a planet there somewhere in the 1900 to 2000 day range. And he went back through his Hubble data and he found the planet. And then people from the European Southern Observatory also took pictures and took pictures of the planet. And they were able to confirm that it was the planet 
thanks to the uh, the data that had been found in Hubble. So it's it's one of the best stories of planetary discovery that I think I've ever heard. And this is and I go into this tomorrow. Uh, forward synthesis, how doomed are the atmospheres of rocky planets around red dwarf stars? Is there no hope? Um, we don't know yet if there is or is not any hope for the atmospheres of planets around red dwarf stars, but we do know that it is a very hostile environment. So think about all of the factors that have to come together, right? So if you've got a planet that's orbiting a red dwarf star, the red dwarf star doesn't have a lot of mass. It's a very, it's a much smaller star than the sun. And so the planet is going to be orbiting it very close. Most likely it's going to be tidally locked because it's so close. So it's going to be showing one face of the planet. At the same time, it was one face of the star. At the same time, these stars are far more active than the main sequence stars like we have with the sun. And so they can release flares that are hundreds of thousands of times more powerful than the kinds of flares that we get with the sun. And so you've got this situation where these planets are huddled up close to have liquid water, and yet the star is throwing out just enormous amounts of very dangerous radiation that would easily strip away all the atmosphere from any world. So the question is, does this always happen? And so we don't know still, right? We haven't taken enough data to be able to actually detect the atmospheres of planets orbiting around red dwarf stars. And if it turns out we do planet after planet after planet, and we don't see any atmospheres at all, then the evidence is looking pretty bad. That said, if a planet can somehow have a very powerful magnetosphere, more powerful than the Earth's magnetosphere, that the, the Earth's magnetosphere is not strong enough to protect against flares like what Proxima Centauri can give off. But if a planet did have one, then maybe it could protect itself from those flares. And then once the star gets through the first few hundred million billion years, then it starts to settle down. And now you've got a place that is of uh, that can survive for trillions of years in the same level of heat. So for the long run, it's a perfect place to live in the short run. It's a it's a really rough first few hundred million years. And right now, we just don't know. Uh, Bobby Reynolds, uh, is it possible to for a planet to steal a moon from other planets? So in theory, you could have a planet steal a moon from another planet. And the best case of this would be, say, Jupiter. Jupiter could theoretically steal a moon from Saturn or from Mars. But for it to be able to do that, that moon has got you've got you've got two things that have to happen. The first thing is, is that that moon we can assume is going around and around the planet. It's got to be right at the very edge of the gravitational well, almost to the point that it's about to fall off. And then because Mars gets closer to the sun and closer to Jupiter, Jupiter gets closer to the sun, farther from Mars, right? There are all these different dynamics that are going on and they would build up over long, long periods of time. And you get to this point where the moon falls off the, the, the gravitational well of, or falls out of the gravitational well of say Mars, but it's not in orbit around Jupiter. Now it's just in orbit around the sun. And so now what's got to happen is you've got to have some kind of kick. So maybe the moon is now orbiting, it's sort of drifting away from Mars, it's going around the sun, Mars is going around the sun, and then maybe this moon and Mars get into some kind of interaction again. And now the moon is kicked out into a different orbit that brings it closer to the orbit of Jupiter. So now it's going to have some kind of interaction with Jupiter, but it's still needs to have some kind of three body interaction. Otherwise, it's just going to go around Jupiter and then continue going around the sun or maybe it's going to crash into Jupiter. So you've got to have some interaction with that moon with one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, uh, Ganymede, something like that to change its orbit into one that actually captures it into some kind of orbit. And when we look at the various solar system, solar system bodies, we look at some of the moons, there are some really puzzling moons in weird places. And the classic example of this is Triton, which is going around Neptune, which by the way, is going to be getting a mission. Um, we hope, and I'm going to do an episode on this. Um, but but you've got this moon that's going backwards from the rest of the all of the large moons in the solar system. So there had to be some kind of capture by Neptune through some kind of three body interaction with some other object that would allow it to be able to end up in this location. So highly unlikely, but 
theoretically possible. And of course, it's theoretically possible that that we could capture uh, other asteroids, things like that from other solar systems in that same way. Um, from Horizon Brave, speaking of, what is the feasibility of pulling an asteroid from the belt to Earth's orbit for mining instead of sending minerals back to Earth from the belt? Yeah, in theory, you can, it will always be this cost benefit analysis. Does it make more sense to bring the asteroid close to Earth and then harvest it close to Earth? Or does it make more sense to harvest the asteroid in place out of the asteroid belt, take all the refined minerals and send them back to the Earth? To move an asteroid is a tall order. You've got to um, set up some kind of gravitational tractor. So you hold a mass very close to the asteroid, maybe tens of meters, hundreds of meters, however close you can get to that to the asteroid. And then you use a your thruster, like an ion engine on your on your ship. And you are constantly pulling away from the asteroid. And then the asteroid, the gravity of this mass is constantly being pulled towards this mass that you're following behind you. And you can slowly change the orbit of the asteroid into one that comes more close to Earth. Maybe you could do some kind of, again, some sort of gravitational slingshot, three body interaction, use the gravity of Jupiter to kick, a, kick an asteroid in a closer place than uh, than it currently is out in the asteroid belt. Of course, it's kind of dangerous, right? If you want to try and have an asteroid end up very close to the Earth. Um, but in theory, it would be more efficient than dismantling the asteroid uh, and then having to fire all of the individual pieces all the way back. But, but most likely what we're going to see is material will be used where it's found. And it's really important to understand that, that we imagine everything going around in the solar system and just these, they're all just floating around and you just have this really easy kick to go from this place to that place. But they're not just floating around. They are, they are, they're, they're on a mountain. The sun is the bottom of, is the valley. And then all of the planets are on this mountain that go up the side of this, these maybe two mountains on either side of the sun. And to go up higher and higher and higher up this gravity well, you have to expand energy. And so the question would be, if, if you wanted to um, uh, harvest water from Mount Everest, does it make more sense to bring the entire top of Mount Everest down to Earth, and then um, melt it for your water? Or does it make more sense to melt the water on the top of Mount Everest, and then uh, have a pipe that brings the water back down to back down to the to base camp from Mount Everest? Both are ridiculous, because both involve going up to the top of Mount Everest. Now, if you're at the top of Mount Everest, and you need to drink, you're going to use the water that's up there. But it's of very little use any other place in the in the, uh, you know, um, in the Himalayas. So that's the kind of analogy that you always need to think about. So the question will always be the, the, the minerals will be best used right where they are. If you need stuff on earth, you get it from earth. If you need stuff on Mars, you get it from Mars. If you need stuff on the moon, you get it from the moon. And to move stuff from one place to another has an enormous cost that you have to then pull into it. Ronald Minch, of the most sun-like stars, do any have promising exoplanets? Define promising. Uh, the Right now, we have not found any Earth-sized world orbiting a sun-like star orbiting within the habitable zone of its star. That is the holy grail. That is the thing that, that astronomers are most hoping for. And so far, that does not exist. And that will probably be a long time before we actually are able to find that. I would guess within five years, maybe. We need James Webb, probably. We need Ariel to launch. Uh, we probably need some of these super telescopes, like the extremely large telescope operating to be able to see this. So the closest one that's been seen, it was just the last couple of weeks ago, there was a, um, 
Uh, there was a planet that was seen with a few times the mass of the Earth orbiting a sun-like star in the habitable zone. That's the best that's been found so far. So we are still a long way, which is great. I mean, the, all of you today will have the opportunity to know that moment when we know of an Earth-sized world orbiting a sun-like star in the habitable zone. It's going to be a gigantic accomplishment, and I can't wait for us to find that. But we're still a ways away. Um, Destonks333. Hey, Fraser, there was a green asteroid or comet that flew over here in Australia recently. Did you see that? What was it? And what would it cause it to glow green? Um, wasn't that from the War of the Worlds? Didn't the asteroids glow green as they entered the Earth's atmosphere and then the three-legged machines came with the Martians? Anyway, no. Um, when... Things interact with the Earth's atmosphere, they are ionizing the oxygen and in the atmosphere, and that causes this. And when oxygen is ionized, it releases a very specific wavelength of photons that appear green to our eyes. You see that with the aurora, the auroras, you see that with this thing called sky glow, which is just particles from the sun hitting the the Earth's atmosphere. And when you get a meteor passing through the atmosphere, it's heating up the atmosphere, and it glows green. And then uh, and so normally, when they start out, they're like white, because they're just they're just very bright, essentially, your piece of rock is 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 melting and releasing an enormous amount of, of energy for its size. But when they get even bigger, then they can do stuff even to the atmosphere as they're passing through. I would love to see. I've only seen like one fireball in my life, and it wasn't anything like that. That one that we had that we saw in Australia. That was absolutely stunning. I can't imagine uh, what it would be like to see that. I mean, some of them you even hear them. Of course, they get bigger and then they get scary again, right? Uh, when you see like the ones in um, uh, like the Chelyabinsk event, when you hear that shock wave and gla and everybody's glass on their house shatters then you know you've got yourself a bit of a problem but but just in general it's a uh um it would be an amazing thing to be able to see and it's great now with more and more cameras it's every every few months we get someone's security cam catches this meteorite passing through the sky which is which is great and sometimes you even see like it just illuminates like at night illuminates like like the whole surrounding like it's daytime and then it gets dark again just absolutely incredible um uh, Mustafa Hassan, will Elon Musk utilize Starlink satellite constellation for the internet connections from Earth to Mars or for future settlements? I who knows what's going to happen. I, the purpose of Starlink is is two things. The first thing is is money, right? That Starlink will generate SpaceX an enormous amount of money if they figure this out. If they are able to provide high speed internet connections to anywhere on earth that is the equivalent of broadband uh, at a reasonable price already they stand to make half they, they stand to be able to deliver half the internet or the world who doesn't have half of the world doesn't have internet and starlink will be able to deliver it at in theory a reasonable price of course i wait in theory until we actually find out what the actual price is um but and so when you think about the telecommunications industry, I've seen it's anywhere from one to $10 trillion is a piece that SpaceX could, could take away from all of our traditional internet providers, cell phone providers, uh, fiber optic providers, all of that. That's a lot of money to build a Mars colony with. And if it is run under SpaceX, not part of a public organization, and all it does is pay for rockets and send those rockets to Mars, that in one fell swoop pays for the entire habitation of Mars. But of course, the other thing is that the people on Mars will need to be able to communicate. In the beginning, they're all going to live probably within a Wi-Fi tower of each other. One 5G connection would do the trick. But in the long run, of course, you're going to want to communicate from Earth to Mars. And Earth is turning, Mars is turning. And so you're going to need some permanent way to be able to communicate between both places. But, but the tiny little Starlinks aren't that good of a way to communicate between planets. They're great to communicate if you're only 150, 200 kilometers below the 
200 miles. Say, say you're 550 kilometers below the satellite, then it's the perfect machine to be able to transmit. But to be able to transmit 80 million kilometers, 40 million kilometers, that requires a very large dish. And so I think that's going to be a completely separate creature. There will eventually be, SpaceX will launch huge uh, internet communication satellites, interplanetary communication satellites, and their job is to beam the data from Earth to Mars in some way. Um, just imagine how long it's going to take. You're looking at sometimes 20 minutes, sometimes uh, more for your messages to go back and forth to Mars. And so how you communicate with people on Earth is going to be totally different. So I think the primary thing, the way that SpaceX is going to or that Starlink is going to play into the Mars plans is just going to pay for it, right? That's like there has up until this point, the way they were going to pay for it was to have people buy rocket launches for their communication satellites or buy rocket launches to go to the International Space Station. That's chump change compared to the world's uh, entire telecommunications industry. And so we'll see how long it's going to take. Uh, bewildering truth seeker. How long does it currently take to get commands to the rovers? It depends on where the earth and Mars in, in their orbits. And I forget the exact number, but I think it can go anywhere between about 20 minutes and about 40 minutes. Dep you know, if, if earth and Mars are on the same side of the sun, then it's very quick. If earth and Mars are on opposite sides of the sun, then you have, then the, the signals take a lot longer. So it just depends on how far away the speed of light is the speed of light. Dennis Tyrant question. What if all of a sudden our supermassive black hole increased up to 2,500 times its original size, what would happen to our galaxies? Um, so let's take, uh, right now the mass of the black hole at the middle of the Milky way is, um, 4.1 million times the mass of the sun, which is a lot, very massive, but there are absolutely supermassive black holes out there with billions of times the mass of the sun, like, like no problem. So, so you can have one that is a thousand times more massive. There are ones that have tens of billions. I believe there are ones that go up to trillions of times or, or on the way up to trillions of times the mass of the sun. Wait, 10 trillion seems like a number that's in my head, but maybe that's wrong. Anyway, um, supermassive black holes can get so much more massive than the one that we have. If our sun, suddenly turned into a supermassive black hole, or sorry, if our if the supermassive black hole turned into one with 2500 times the mass, then that would change some of the mass. But the supermassive black hole is not the anchor, the gravitational anchor of the entire galaxy, it only accounts for uh, a fraction of the mass of the entire galaxy. And so very little would change, you would have very close to it, stars would have their orbits change pretty dramatically. But farther away out here, we would probably not even experience it, it would just be the the it's the dark matter halo that surrounds the entire Milky Way that is the actual true anchor that is causing the the uh, the galaxy to spin and all the stars to spin inside of it. So you can change supermassive black holes it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Mr. Hand, will Space Force administer justice in space? Um, no, with who? Regarding what? Um, like, will Space Force protect the interests of the United States, the, the, the political economic interests of the United States as it relates to space? Yes, you will see, for example, I'm sure Space Force has satellite killing missiles, that if, if a war begins, the first thing that everybody's going to do is blow up everybody's satellites because they are so important. They are your eyes. Everybody knows where everybody's satellites are and they are crucial to being able to communicate and crucial to being able to, to navigate, um, being able to, uh, just like so much of our modern life, being able to see the weather, et cetera. Right. Uh, so you would, the first thing that every nation will do is they'll have a plan to destroy everybody's satellites. So is that administering justice? I mean, there, you know, uh, do warships administer justice when they shoot each other? I, so I think they will, they will be able to, 
uh, they will they will carry out the battlefield for the United States in the space zone. What's the, the what do they call it? I forget the name. Um, in that in that part of the sphere, right? That's it. That's what they're for. And they won't be that justice will be happening through the courts. And it'll, ha it'll be things like uh, this satellite was launched into a bad orbit and it accidentally smashed into one of the United States satellites. And so they have to go to international law and they have to uh, go to the United Nations and and ask that the offending satellite pay reparations for doing that. And if they don't do it, then then there will be then how do you, what happens when you break rules, international rules right now? So no, I can't imagine that they will be enforcing justice. I mean, I think people have this this romantic notion about what Space Force is, that it's a bunch of people training uh, with their battle cruisers to fly in space to to defend the Earth from the alien attack and battle one another in hand to hand combat and zero gravity. And that is not that's not what Space Force is. Space Force is managing those anti satellite killing rockets, uh, uh, running and launching surveillance satellites communication satellites and then trying to figure out what the other nations on earth are doing with their space assets. So, um, no, I can't imagine that, uh, that we're going to see any, anything heroic. Everybody who works at space force is going to work on the ground. I would be incredibly surprised if a single person ever gets in a spacesuit as part of space force. Uh, Miracle Guy 2, will there be a church in a lunar or Martian colony? Sure. Wherever humans go, they take their churches with them. Why would they? Uh, but, I mean, would they? I don't, I mean, I'm not sure what the, uh, the religious problems are of being on another planet, but yeah, seems like it would happen. Let's see. Apologies. Uh, Nickel Girl, how likely do you think that we'll discover life on Enceladus? I mean, we have no idea. Um, the on Enceladus, we know that all of the conditions for life seem to be there. We have liquid water in vast amounts. We have some kind of energy source that is dumping heat into the under ice oceans. We know that there are the food for bacteria, uh, hydrogen gas and other interesting elements are finding their way out of Enceladus and into space. So everything is there and it all looks good. But the question is, did life form on Enceladus on its own or did life move from Earth or one of the other planets in the solar system to Enceladus? My, I don't think we're going to find life in the solar system. That's just my guess. I think that if there was life, it would be obvious Er that that right now we look at Mars and it looks dry and dead. But if there was some kind of life, some kind of algae bloom, some kind of cyanobacteria mat, something, we would it would have already been obvious. We'd be making its presence in the atmosphere. We would see it there. If there was something on Enceladus, maybe we would see some kind of evidence of it. But right now, we don't see any evidence. Now that that doesn't mean that it's not there. I mean, it could just be really hard to find. But but the harder it gets to find the just the less likely it is that it's there. And so I think that my my feeling is and same thing with just alien life in general, I just feel like, like, we would, if there was life out there in the universe, it would have found its way to us. Just like, like life finds its way to a sandwich that you put in the fridge. You, you take a sandwich, eat a bite, put it, in the, put it in the fridge, come back a week later, and the whole sandwich is covered in life. Now you delivered the life, but the life found its way to every corner of that sandwich. Uh, you didn't, it didn't require searching to find it. 
And so I feel like that's the thing that life is very good at is, is moving itself into every single possible niche. There's no place that you can go. You scoop up every drop of water on earth. You sample every piece of atmosphere, dig up any little piece of soil, and you will find it teeming with life because life is finding its way into every single nook and cranny. And so my feeling is that we won't find anything. But that is not a reason not to look, right? That, that in fact, that's, that's a terrible reason to not look, that you have a feeling, right? You should ignore your feelings, choke them down, and go look. That's what science says. So my, and I would be willing to fund, you know, if I, if I was in charge of NASA, I would spend a lot of money attempting to get to the, get the answer to this question. It's a fascinating question. It is the most important question that humanity can really ask itself is, are we alone in the universe? And I would like to know the answer. So uh, I don't feel like we'll find anything on Enceladus or Mars or any of these places, but I think we should look as hard as we can for as long as we can. Uh, Avi Scott and Flower, what is the future maximum theoretical limit of an ion engine? Uh, well, there's no theoretical limit to the maximum velocity that any rocket system, any any propellant based system can achieve. A, a starship could theoretically go almost to the speed of light. It's like a SpaceX starship, a Falcon 9 could go almost the speed of light as long as you could keep getting fuel into its rocket system. And that's, of course, the problem. And the same thing goes with ion engines. So, so how much fuel, how much xenon fuel could you carry on an ion engine, and then fire it for how long to a reasonable amount? I don't know what the number is. But, um, you know, you could easily reach hundreds of thousands of kilometers an hour using as well as using um, uh, gravitational slingshots, you can go very fast. The great thing about ion engines, is they can go for they can fire for years. So you just sip away at your at your fuel tank for years to get there. Um, the delicious plum uh, have any of the lava tubes caves, the ones that Mars is supposed to be host to, to been explored, life may be deep in those lava tubes and caves. No, no, the best place, the place we should look first are those lava tubes on Mars. There are places on Mars, w which are old lava tubes, like what we have here on Earth, the um, the lava went through the tube, uh, poured out the other side left this perfect hollow, the we can see that they're there because the roof has collapsed. But inside you would expect the conditions would be a lot nicer. They would have the temperatures would be more reasonable. They're not in the direct radiation. They're not in that direct sunlight. Uh, they should be the first places that we look when we go to to Mars. And in fact, I've done an episode on this, this has been a thing that 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 NASA and especially the European Space Agency, they have a great program called the, U, U, um, the ESA Caves Program, and they are actively testing out techniques to send both robots and humans into caves to try to explore them. So I think that once we see boots on the ground on the moon, boots on the ground on Mars, to just like have a person stand there and not die, then a high priority is going to be going to one of these caves. In fact, I, I'm sure that we'll see caves going to all of the different sorry, we'll see rovers going to some caves both on the moon and Mars sooner than sooner than later. Um, so Dr. Ed Elcott, cryptozoologist, what would be the best way to deal with astronauts mental health on long voyages? AI that assists in mental health evaluations or the good old standby drugs. This, I mean, this is definitely a concern, but it has been, a, this is a solved problem. How do you stop people who are cooped up together in small areas f for long periods of time that are in danger from getting space madness? And, but we have versions of that in Antarctica. You have people that are in a fairly confined place that's very dangerous. Uh, they have to get along with each other for six months at a time. You have 
people who go on submarines, <laughs> they're, they're underwater, very dangerous. They're in very cramped quarters. They're having to do hard work side by side. I'm sure there are problems. And the solution is the personalities of the, of the astronauts. And I've mentioned this in the past that, that if you talk to astronauts, you, the, the thing that you get from them is that they are agreeable. They are, I mean, they, they are technically competent. Uh, they're whip smart, they are well read, but they are really nice. And I think that that is the key. Um, uh, that that they can get along with each other for long periods of time. And, and that is the thing that's the personality trait that you would want to be looking. they're always looking to build teamwork, they're always looking to make each other's lives easier, they're always looking to share responsibility. They are always looking to over communicate where they're at in in how they're feeling about the mission and, and what their responsibilities are. And the the times that I've had a chance to talk with with astronauts, they're just so great. <laughs> they're the greatest people. And you can see why they've been chosen. Uh, you can talk. I've had a couple of chances. I've had to talk with an astronaut for a couple of hours. And it is just, you know, those times when conversation just just you don't even notice the time going you're having such a good time talking to another person. That's what it's like. And so you would hope that these people would be constantly bringing the joy, help cheering each other up, making each other feel better, making the journey worthwhile. And, and so I don't think that that's that big of a problem. We have dealt with this in the past. We've, we know how to deal with it. Um, People always say that that's the, that's the hardest part, but I don't think it's the hardest part. The hardest part is the lack of atmosphere, radiation damage, lack of gravity, the fact that you're going tens of thousands of kilometers per hour. Um, uh, okay, so MN, would you want three optical or radio telescopes at L4, L, or L3, L4, and L5? So for... For uh, I would want three radio telescopes, not optical telescopes. So the so L three, L four, L five. L three is on the other side of the sun. L four is the Lagrange point that is sixty degrees in front of the Earth in its orbit, and L four is sixty degrees. L five is sixty degrees behind the Earth in its orbit, and so you've got this balance. Two of them are perfectly balanced. The the one in the L4 and the L5, they'll just remain there. The one at the L3 point, you've got to constantly use um, engines to be able to keep it going. Um, and if you did, then you would have a telescope, a radio telescope with a baseline that is 150 million kilometers across and then you could have those three radio telescopes capture images of some object at the same time and then you would use computers to combine the the data coming from those three radio telescopes and you would end up with you would have a, a telescope with the resolution is as if you had a telescope that was as big as the earth's orbit um, it wouldn't have the the light gathering power, but it would be able to do things like take very bright objects like supermassive black holes and be able to see right into the event, like right to the edge of the event horizon with unprecedented detail. You look at a quasar and you would see more features and details than, than uh, you can even imagine. Uh, that would be great. Yes, please. Let's do that. Let's get on that. It doesn't sound like it would be that difficult, right? A radio telescope at the, we've, we've put spacecraft to the L4, L5, points uh having one go to the other side of the sun that should be relatively straightforward to do that they would be able to see each other let's get on it we did an episode uh, about a year ago about future gravitational wave observatories and this was one of the ideas that i mentioned in that uh visto tutti ligo shows us that gravity itself propagates at the speed of light how does that change the motion of stars around the milky way thousands of years to sense the movement of the other stars it happens a little bit at a time um the like right now we are orbiting the sun and we are experiencing the sun's gravity from eight and a half eight just over eight minutes ago and yet 
that's enough to keep us in orbit. If the sun disappeared, we would continue to orbit the sun for another eight minutes and then we would fly off, you know, the missing sun and we'd fly off into space. So yeah, all of the stars are experiencing delays from the gravity. But when you think about the speed that they're moving, they may take 250 million years to go 230 million years to go around the entire Milky Way. But they're going to experience the gravity the most distant that they would experience would be, say 130,000 years for that gravity to reach them. So it's a drop in the bucket. Bewildering truth seeker, do you think that the shuttle program was prematurely ended? So I guess the question you're asking is, do I think that the space shuttle should have been canceled in 2011? Yeah, I think I think shutting down the space shuttle program was the right thing to do. We could see that it was dangerous because of the Challenger and the Columbia accidents, as well as other um, dangerous flaws in just the way the space shuttle operated. And part of the problem is just how it was envisioned in the first place. They gave it too many tasks to carry cargo, to carry astronauts, to do science, to do launch satellites, to carry out military missions, all this stuff. They, that was a mistake. And, and the, those mistakes were paid in human lives. Uh, so shutting that down was the right move. The mistake was not having a backup replacement ready to go in time. The, the construction of the Ares program. So like we know the space launch system today, but the space launch system is, was originally this, this thing called the, the Ares program. There's the Ares five and the Ares one and the Ares five is going to be the super heavy cargo rocket. And then the Ares one would be the much smaller, um, crew capsule and think about say the space launch system and a Falcon nine and they went down that path. And that was, I think that was a perfect path. I mean, obviously now we know that reusable rockets are even better, but I think that was the right direction. And then for some reason they merged it together again. And so now we've got the space launch system and these smaller rockets that, so you're going to put the astronauts on this gigantic rocket, which is still a, a safer concept than the space shuttle. And they're going to fly to they're going to fly to space all in one launch, which has some benefits. But the other way is have your rocket go up to space, have the astronauts shift from a nice safe capsule to your big rocket when it's safest and then fly to whatever is your destination. So yeah, I think shutting down the space shuttle was the right move. Uh, building the space shuttle in the first place was probably a mistake. It was a um, you know, it never fulfilled the objective that it, you know, when you think about all the things that the space shuttle did, other methods could have done those things better. But sometimes you don't know whether or not you have a good, whether it's the right thing to do until you go down a pathway, until you choose a course of action and then you see the consequences. And I'm sure that's what happened. I'm sure if you went back to 1970, and got a chance to talk to the spatial engineers and go, this thing is going to have two accidents and these are all the problems they would, they would go down a different direction, but you know, hindsight is 2020. And that said, I think the space shuttle is the most amazing, wonderful machine that humanity has ever built. Every part of the space shuttle is a marvel of, of ingenuity and engineering and, and, and performance, those rocket engines, the RS 25s, I have a whole episode where I just, just wax poetically about the RS 25 engines, they're phenomenal. And so I think you can have those two thoughts in your mind, you can say that thing that you built, that is the most incredible piece of engineering that humanity has ever done, probably shouldn't have been built. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but good job. Um, Arjone, do you think there's a lot of room for competition in the small form rocket category or does Electron have that area locked? I think for now there is room for competition for different rockets. Uh, Electron is one variety, but it is like, it's a fairly classic rocket. It's a multi-stage rocket. It's a two stage, three stage, two stage, two stage rocket. Um, it's got a bunch of really clever ideas and it's designed to launch small payloads. So if you don't want to go where the Falcon heavy is going, you want your rock, you want your satellite to go on, on the, the orbit of your choosing, then you go with this smaller electron rocket and it's great, but it won't hold a candle to starship starship 
could take your tiny little CubeSat or whatever, you know, your 1,000 kilogram payload or 500 kilogram payload, put it in your Starship, launch it, come back to Earth, and it would still be cheaper than Electron. So it's a, it is a very, right now, if Starship doesn't work, then there's a ton of room in this small, in the smaller space, these smaller launchers to be able to deliver these kinds of payloads into orbit. If Starship works, then every other rocket concept is instantly obsolete. All of them from SLS to Electron. And, and I would expect that every oh and and starship is as small as it can be right you cannot have a smaller rocket do full reusability the way starship does in fact they get better when you make them even bigger and that's why musk has said that he's planning on building an even bigger um uh rocket than starship something that will have say maybe four times the uh the diameter size of the of the of the bay of the cargo hold the fairing um, that's crazy, uh, but that, but that's when the economics of these two stage rockets really start to work out. But this is all in theory, uh, making a spaceship, making starship be able to make its way back through the atmosphere safely and land near the launch pad is that's the challenge. And that is the part that like right now, here we are, we're almost a year, a year since the star hopper was launching. Did you really think it would take this long for Starship to get where it is today? Like what does Starship do right now today? It explodes, right? And good. Like that shows that they are, they are rapidly testing different prototypes and making sure that they work the way they're supposed to work. And that is, and, and I have massive admiration for the way their engineering development system works, but the problem is really hard. The prize is to make every rocket system that exists across the world completely obsolete. So it's totally worth it, but the challenge is enormous. And so it's so much fun to watch this happen. I both, I both enjoy the audacity of, of what SpaceX is planning to do, what, what Musk has planned. And then I also admire reality showing how hard this is. And for me, it's like watching a, it's watching a story unfold in, in real time, day after day after day, where we don't know what the ending is going to be. And then there's the highs and there's lows and there's, and there's different players involved. And what's United Launch Alliance going to do? And what's Jeff Bezos working on? I find this, this narrative, I, I couldn't write it as a television show and have it be more interesting in my mind. But then I, I have this tendency to, I don't know, sort of anthropomorphize all of these kinds of events. When I watch what happens with um, the search for dark matter or the cosmological, you know, the crisis in cosmology, each one of these uh, are so fascinating to watch each discovery and and I find, and that's why it sort of makes me frustra frustrated, I guess, when people just casually dismiss it, right? It's the equivalent of casually dismissing a boxing match and going, it's just two people punching each other. It's casually dismissing a soccer match and just saying, oh, it's just a bunch of people running around on a field with a ball. Like, I did that as a child. Boring. Uh, no, there is a deep narrative that is being played out in real time in front of our eyes and we get to be a part of it. And I, I'm so honored to, to know enough and to be able to share it with you and share that enthusiasm. So I hope you enjoy it too. Uh, Joe Su Kaban, how different would life look on earth if the sun was a different kind of star? Uh, well, so let's assume that the earth will remain in the same habitable zone as being uh, around the sun. So say it was a smaller red dwarf star, then the earth would be very close. And let's say that it's not getting t terrible, horrible solar flares. Well, the whole point of what the habitable zone means is that you are in the place where liquid water can exist. And so 
in theory, you would have liquid water on Earth. But the problem is, is that the wavelength of the photons that are coming from, say, a red dwarf star are pushed into the red end of the spectrum. And so the thinking goes is that that's not a lot of energy for plant life to be able to use to grow. And so you would find a fairly um, sad <laughs> uh, environment on on a planet that is orbiting, it would be you wouldn't have a lot of complex uh, life forms, uh, you wouldn't have a lot of um, uh, larger animals, things like that, you would have like, I forget the number, it's like one, one hundred thousandth, the amount of available energy for life, even if it's adapted to using that red spectrum, infrared, etc. And then if you went the other way, if you went um, to say a really powerful star, like a, I don't know, like a Rigel, something that's like three, four times, but not like a super giant, but something that's three, four, five, ten times the mass of the sun, your star is going to have a short light. But again, you're farther away from the star. And so you're in the habitable zone. And now you're getting a lot of really high energy photons. So radiation is a problem. But assuming you've got a thick enough atmosphere, assuming that you've got a, um, uh, you know, you can protect yourself, and you've adapted to that radiation, it might be very useful to have that high level of energy, a very energetic environment. And so that might be really interesting, especially if you're underground underwater it might be a very thriving very uh very active place so i think you would want to go you definitely want to go more towards the more active brighter more powerful stars grant w are damaging effects of radiation on asteroids during the trip to mars underappreciated uh so as you know the second you get away from the earth's atmosphere away from the earth's magnetosphere you are under this constant radiation damage from the sun, and more terrifyingly from cosmic rays, which are like little bullets shooting out your DNA uh, in the bad way. Um, and that leads to cancer down the road. So, so the 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 sort of extreme event that you have to be worried about is something like a solar storm where a big flare goes off the sun, and you've got this really powerful cloud, you know, cloud of particles that buzz through and you could give people enough of a radiation dose in just a couple of hours to kill them. So assuming that that doesn't happen. Um, and then you're getting a very high dose of radiation while you're on your way to Mars, you can protect it a little bit, but not really, there's not a lot that can stop those cosmic rays just busting through your spacecraft. So uh, you are looking at an increased rate of cancer. And and for a lot of people, that's fine. Um, because I mean, like people smoke, that's an increased rate of cancer. Um, people eat fried food, fried meat, which apparently has an increased rate of cancer. There's a lot of things that there are a lot of choices that we make in our lives that increases our rate, our risk of getting cancer, and we do it willingly. So there are plenty of people who would be glad to take that trip. Hopefully they would go as quickly as they could to Mars. They would uh, quickly get underground uh, the second they land on Mars and try to minimize that uh, long-term effect of the of the cancer. So uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's underappreciated. Uh, I don't think it's overappreciated. I think everybody knows that you're gonna get a higher chance of cancer, and when you if if 30 years later you end up with cancer. You know why you went to Mars, you knew the risks, you were willing to do it. Um, and, and hopefully treatments will improve. Uh, no in Mia, no in Mia. <laughs> what are your expectations from the James Webb? When the James Webb telescope finally launches and gets operational? Oh, I have got so much uh, expectations for the James Webb Space Telescope. I mean, James Webb is our first crack at observing exoplanets directly. Because right now we observe exoplanets as they pass in front of the star from our perspective, and we see how the light from the star goes through the atmosphere of the planet and, and we can kind of detect that it has water, whatever, right? The but James Webb will just look at these worlds, the close ones and just go, Oh, I can see the at the some of the chemicals in the atmosphere of that planet. 
So it could be the one that finds a earth like world. It could detect life in the atmosphere or the effect of life in the atmosphere of another planet. So that's a huge thing. Plus all of the other stuff that it's going to do. It's going to be able to look through to see newly forming planetary systems. It's going to be able to look through the gas and the dust that is obscuring our view to a lot of the parts of the Milky Way. Um, and then it's going to be able to look right out to the very edge of the observable universe. This time when the first galaxies were coming together that will help us understand how we live in this large grand spiral galaxy today. What were the, what were the first building blocks that came together? Uh, so yeah, James Webb must launch. It is a, I mean, the hopes and dreams of astronomers for 20 years have gone into this one telescope. They really need it. So I hope, um, I hope it launches. Oh, I really hope it launches. <laughs> Uh, uh, Eric XD, when it comes to cleaning up space debris, what are the best options that we have at the moment? Uh, the, I mean, there's lots of ideas. You attach a grapple to, you have a satellite that catches up with another satellite and attaches a grapple and the two deorbit. So I, I want to sort of break this into three ideas, right? The one idea is you try to clean up space debris one piece at a time. And for a lot of space debris, like spent boosters that are on a very high orbit, there's no nothing else you can really do, you've got to go out individually one by one. Um, but imagine like, that you are trying to catch cars, catch airplanes and fix them uh, one by one. It's very expensive. Um, so but that that may have to be done for a lot of the most dangerous stuff that's going to be up there for a long time. The other thing is just the prevention you should build into every single one of your uh, spacecraft, some method of deorbiting. And the simplest one we had the interview with the with the folks from Tethers Unlimited a couple of months ago, that you just reel out a ribbon from the bottom of your spacecraft, and it interacts with the Earth's atmosphere, and it sucks the spacecraft down and it's gone. So that should be mandatory. There's some mechanism like like you should not be allowed to launch a satellite unless you know how you're going to clean up after yourself every part of your space junk. Uh, if you can't prove that you've thought this through, then you don't get to launch. Um, and then the other one is being able to shoot from afar. And that's where the laser system works out best. You've got a you've got a some kind of satellite, a space based laser system that is turning and zapping pieces of space junk as they fly by. And that vaporizes a tiny little bit of the of the space junk and causes it to slow down or or deorbit a little bit. You do that enough times, and they will what would have taken them hundreds of years to deorbit, they'll do it within five years. So I think you're going to need all three of those to really deal with the space junk problem that we have. Um, <laughs> Neko girl asks, what are the chances we'll find a biosignature with James Webb? Well, you know, my opinion, which is that I don't think we'll find any, but I think we should look. So, uh, yeah, I don't think we'll find anything ever anywhere. And I know that's like, that's not what you wanted to hear, but I also think that we should try as hard as we can to find them. Um, Tom Pava is the plane of the ecliptic of our solar system in alignment with the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. No, the uh, and you can you can demonstrate this for yourself. So if you go out every night and you start to get to know where the sky is, the sun, the moon, the planets, they all take this exact same path across the sky. It's called the, the plane of the ecliptic. And when you sort of imagine in 3D, when you map that out, it is this disk that all of the planets are orbiting within and we are on that disk and you are seeing so when you're right on the equator and you look up, you can watch the planet ecliptic move right over your head, the sun, the moon, the planets, they all move right over your head. The Milky Way is in a different area. For me, the Milky Way goes sort of my won't help if I point, <laughs> but it, but, and so they are, they are actually, they form a 63 degree angle in the sky. If you measure the angle between the plane of the ecliptic and the Milky Way, they are a 60 degree, three degree angle. So if you imagine the solar system in the Milky Way, it is tilted at 63 degrees. 
and every solar system in the Milky Way is tilted in random ways. All right, we've reached the end of our hour. Uh, thanks, everybody, for taking the time to hang out with me today. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we've got a new episode coming tomorrow all about the planets of Proxima Centauri. We've got a new QA coming on Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday. And then we've got another episode coming out at the end of the week all about uh, NASA's mission to Triton. So stick around. Um, and we will, uh, we've got lots more. And then another virtual star party the last one of the season on Sunday, uh, the last astronomy cast on Friday. It's going to be our summer sky watching tips. So Pamela and I will give you all the advice on what to see in the night sky. Uh, our final episode, we've got two more episodes of the weekly space hangout, uh, this week with Elizabeth Howell and her co-author on a book. And then I forget what the last one is. So, uh, we've got a bunch more shows before we go on hiatus. So, and then I will see you here next week, one last time for the summer. So thanks everybody. I always super enjoy this. Uh, I love that I don't know what we're going to be talking about. And yet I do find uh, it incredibly fun to have these conversations with you. So I hope you enjoy it too. And I'll see all of you next week. How do I stop this thing?